through God. Well, everybody open your Bibles today. Let's look at, uh, let's start in Joshua. You know, I was uh, reading, thinking about this message today, and, and uh, it's interesting. They sang a song about trusting Jesus, and then Rick talked about trusting God. And we're going to talk about trusting God today, amen? Right. You know, we've been talking about He's got promises for us. Right? Everybody's been here. We, you know, when I was here last time, we talked about great and precious promises. And they're for us. They're for us to have. And the enemy knows that they're for us to have. Guess what? You got an enemy. Right? And he knows that you got promises. And he can't do anything to keep you from getting them except make you quit. Right? That's, that's his only action is to get you qu to quit. And so we endeavor here to think on the goodness of God at all times. To preach on the goodness of God, to encourage, to exhort. We're not talking about being condemned or you ain't done enough. You know what? You ain't ever going to do enough. I ain't ever going to do enough. Because I don't have to do anything to get the grace of God. I don't have to do anything for Him to love me. He loved me and so He gives me ability to do things. And that's why I want to do them because He gave me ability to do them. Not because He wants me to do them to show my love for Him. He wants me to do them because I do love Him. Amen? Right? How many got kids? Do you want your kids doing something to prove they love you? No, you want them to do it because they love you. Amen? Because they love you. You know, I don't want proof. You don't have to prove. We're not trying to prove anything to God. Right? <laughs> His grace was sufficient. Right? Amen. But we always want to keep in mind His goodness. I remember when I was... Uh, teaching Bible studies years ago. That's all I wanted was to people to know he was good because so many people I found out when I started talking about how good he was, they started, they started getting mad at me. When they said, well, yeah, but he could have stopped it or, well, he let this person die or he didn't pay my bills, he didn't meet my needs. And they had all these reasons why God wasn't good. And every one of them was based on their ex experience or inexperience of his goodness. Right? And we don't base what we believe on that. Or we'll never have the promises. Because how many in here have experienced bad things in their life? Is there anybody in here that has not experienced something bad in your life? You probably can't raise your hand, first of all, because you're too young. <laughs> as soon as I see this little hand come out of a, out of a baby carrier, and I'll say, okay, you're right, you haven't. Amen? But we have to fight for our right to be blessed. Amen. People, people don't like that. People want to just be blessed. They don't want to have to do anything to be blessed. But you do have to do something. Because what you do have to do is not quit. That's your part of being blessed, not quitting. Because we are blessed. And the only thing that the devil can do, he has no weapon against you, just as Brother Rick talked about. There is no, we are undefeatable. We cannot be defeated, so he must make you quit. Because if you don't quit, you do win. It's, it's, it, is, it, is, it is not up to him. He has, no, he, can't, he has no say about it. He has no power. He has no authority. You are a winner. So what he has to do is get you to not be a winner. Quit. And so in doing so, he, he, doesn't, he, doesn't, he, he doesn't just come at you one direction. He comes at you 25 different directions and sees which one of these will give you the opportunity that you'll take to quit. Where is your weakness? Where is your stopping point? Where, do, where does your faith end? Because that's where he's trying to get to. He's trying to get to where your faith won't go. Amen? Because where your faith won't go is where you'll quit. That's your fainting place. Amen? Let's look at Joshua 21, 45. This is the God we serve. Paul, Paul wrote this, and we, we read it. He didn't write this, but we read it, oh, in our chapters just a few weeks ago. Um, he said, if anybody preaches a gospel other than the one I'm preaching, or they preach a Jesus, uh, they're wrong, basically, is what he's saying. He's saying, this is the gospel. If you're preaching something that says it's gospel, and it, which means good news, and it ain't good news, it ain't the gospel. Amen. Amen? If you're preaching something that is not good, that does not help people, that does not love people, that does not build people up, right? If you tear somebody down, that's not the gospel. That's right. 
Jesus did not come to tear down. He came to build up. Amen? The gospel is the goodness of God. And it is that He is a good God and that He has good plans for you. And that he, everywhere, all it is is good. Right? If you get tired of hearing the word good, you don't want to be around God's people because God's people should be talking about good all the time. Right? People say, oh, I watched the news this week and I didn't see a lot of good. You know what? The devil's going to make sure of that. If you'll say that sentence, you just helped him. As evil as he is, God is more gooder. And as evil as he can get, God can be more gooder still. He can't be more evil than God is good. It's not possible. And if you're waiting on the news to show you the goodness of God, you're looking in the wrong place. Search here. This is where it's at. He's good. Amen? And it doesn't matter what we see or hear. He didn't change. And if the enemy gets something over on somebody, we have compassion on them and we love them and we believe for them and we have faith for them and we ask for comfort for them. But we do not believe God is less good than He is. We never step one inch off God's side ever. Amen? Because He's a good God. Verse Joshua 21, 45 proves it out. It says, there failed not aught. I don't know what an ought is, but there didn't fail any of them. <laughs> not aught of any good thing which the Lord had spoken unto the house of Israel all came to pass. If God speaks it, it's coming to pass. Amen? Amen? If God says, that's what we should be looking for. What does God say about me? God says you're the apple of His eye. He says you're a blessing. He says He loves you. He, he rejoices over you and sings about you. That's how God feels about you. No matter how stupid I've been, no matter what I've done, He loves me. And He's thinking good thoughts about me. And everything He's spoken about me or towards me, every good promise He's given me will come to pass. So what does the devil have to do to get that to be of no effect? He's got to get you not to receive it. Right? It's going to come to pass. So what can I do to make it of no effect? Get you not to have it. Right? And how does he get you not to have it? Get you to quit. Right? Because what God says is going to come. We've been talking about His promises. His exceeding great and precious promises. They're exceeding, they're great, and they're precious. And they're for us. But they're for us to receive. Right? What did it say this morning about reaping a harvest? We shall reap if we faint not. So what's the devil's, what's the devil's mode of operation? I've got to get him to quit. I got to get him to quit. How does he get you to quit? He gets you to quit trusting in the word that God gave you. He gets you to trust something else. He gets you to not trust that. He gets you to look at other things. He gets you to get off of God's vision of who you are and onto your vision of who you are or onto the vision of other people who say you aren't. Right? He's got to get you away from what God says. Look at uh, 1 Kings 8. 8 56, 1 Kings 856. This is the certainty of God. See, we're not looking for God's side. God doesn't change. Amen. If God was good from the beginning, He's good now. And guess what? You can't do anything to make Him less good. In other words, there's not anything in your life that you can do and He's going to say, well, I just don't want to be good to them anymore. He's already been good to you. He doesn't take back His goodness. The worst of the worst, what we would consider the worst of the worst people ever, He still was good to them. He still died for them. I was on the plane yesterday coming back here. Thank God I'm back here. By the way, it's so good to see you guys. Not, not that I, Florida's great and I enjoy being there. Don't, don't get me wrong. I enjoy going, I enjoy being part of this ministry in wherever they are. I really do. And everything that God gives me to do is a joy. But this is home. You know, somebody asked me one day, you like Branson or Florida? I'm like, home, of course. 
You know, I'm sure the Caribbean's nice too, but I just want to visit it. I don't want to live there. <laughs> but, you know, Florida, I, you know, I've got family there too, so it's a nice place to go. This is still where I live, and uh, it's nice to come home. Uh, what was I talking about? You guys, oh, on the plane. On the plane. I'm on the plane, and, I'm, and uh, there, there comes on a, a guy who uh, is probably 60, and he's dressed in attire that would make him maybe 14, <laughs> and got a, got a haircut that would justify 14. And I don't mean it was nice and style. I mean, he had like a mohawk and colored mohawk. And, you know, immediately I said, that's just weird. <laughs> I didn't say it out loud. And I'm not saying it's right. I said, that's just weird. And immediately in my heart, God said, Jesus died for him. Just like he died for you. And he needs to know it, just like everyone else. And see, that's what that, I want to think that thought first. Yeah. Amen. Right? I want to think, instead of thinking that's weird, you know what, you can find a thousand. Weird is just different to you. Right? I'm weird, right? Why? Because I'm different than you. Right? Everybody, Jesus died for everybody, and his good and precious promises are to fail no one. Amen? And, and we as Christians, our, we, should, we should desire to have these promises. We should desire to have this goodness in our life. We should desire to know this every day of our life, that not one of His promises, what does it say in 856? It says, Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto His people Israel, according to all He promised, all, not half that He promised, all that He promised, there has failed not one word of His good promise. Notice that all, it doesn't just say His promise. His, in the, on the other verse we read, it was His good word. This is His good promise. Amen? It's because He's a good God. Yep. Right? You can put that in front of Him every time. You talk about God, you can say, Oh, my good God did this today. My good Father did this today. My good... Just call Him good all the time because the gooder you think He is, He's gooder us than that. Yeah. Amen? Amen? We serve an exceeding good God. Amen? And not one of His promises towards you is made to fail. All of them should come to pass. If it's prosperity, if it's peace, if it's joy, if, if, if it's health, if it's family, if it's friends, it doesn't matter. Whatever His promises are towards us, they have come to pass. And the devil says, I don't want you having those. So what can I do? i got to get them to quit. I've got to get them to faint. I've got to make it too hard to get. And you hear people say it all the time. Oh, this Christianity, it's too hard. You ought to just be able to have it. You do have it, but he's the one making it hard. If we just believed, it wouldn't be hard. Think about this. If you just believed 1 Peter 2.24, if we, let me, let me rephrase that. If I just believed 1 Peter 2.24, you guys all do. But let's say that I just believed it. The minute sickness came to my door, I would say, that can't be true because all His promises have come to pass in my life and I'm healed by the stripes on Jesus' back. And then I wouldn't go away quoting that verse anymore. I would believe that word and I would go on to the next thing in my life. Why? Because I believe that word and I trust that what He says He will do, He will do. Amen. Amen? And if I trust what He says He will do, He will do, then it's no longer... Uh, it, people, that, it, we've got it to where, oh, I've got I to gotta believe, I've got to get my scriptures, I've got to put them on the, on the mirror, I've got to put them on the refrigerator, I've got I to gotta, I gotta quote them 55 times a day. And you know what? You don't got to, but you can. And there's nothing wrong with doing all that, but that can't be what you have to do. Amen. What you have to do is not quit. Because right. if you do not quit, you will win. Yes. Amen? And if that helps you not to quit, then by all means do it. But if you think it's helping God's Word work, God's Word's already worked. 
You aren't, you aren't adding the gas to the fire. He's already flamed it up real good for us. Amen? Amen. 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 He's done it all. And so we're, we're not trying to make His Word work. His Word stands by itself forever and will never, ever fade away. That's right. Amen? And it will always accomplish. It says always. Always. Notice there's always and unfailing. Why are these? Because the God of love spoke them. And the God of love, when He speaks, He speaks unfailing words. He says unfailing things. And, and when He says it, we can trust it. Amen. If you knew something could not fail, you would trust it. Amen. Right? You'd step out on it every time. Right? I don't care if it was invisible. Right? When I first started... I'm going to quit saying right. I think I've said right a thousand times today. Right? Right? <laughs> <laughs> that could irritate me. Did I irritate you guys? Get over it so you can receive, okay? <laughs> when I first started flying a bunch was when I came here, actually, because they kept sending me places. And, and I hadn't flown a whole lot. And, and I didn't really like flying. Why? Because I didn't trust it. You know? Uh, you know, all you hear about flying when you don't fly much is about the wrecks. <laughs> And guess what? People don't make it out of those. You know? And you're like, huh. And so, but you know what happens? It's just like anything else. As you grow in it, you learn to trust it. Why? Because you know the bumps, you know the humps, you know the, you know the little things about it, and they don't bother you. You know, the first time you hit, you hit some, some little, little bit of, what do they call it, turbulence? First time you're ever flying and you hit a little bit of that, you're like, whoa, hey, hey, ho, 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 what's this? You know? And now when you hit them, it kind of rocks you to sleep. Right? You know, like Mike, he'd understand. He's flown everywhere. You know, he'll, you hit a bump and he'll keep talking to you like nothing even happened. He can spill his soup on his lap. So oh, just a bump. Why? He trusts the air travel because he's done it over and over again and he's seen it work. God's Word has been proven over Amen. and over and over and over again. And it is spoken by an unfailing, loving God who will never fail you. So our trust in Him can be absolute. Absolute. And that's what it's got to be. We've got to get to the place where the first thing we do is trust Him. Right? Because trust is a faith. If untrust, is untrust a word? Untrust is today. Yeah. Untrust is a faith killer. Yeah. It's a faith killer. You want your faith to fail? Stop trusting God. Right? That's what the devil's trying to do. It. That's why he's trying to get you to quit trusting in the word God gave you. God said the plane will fly. Right? <laughs> get on it. <laughs> Trust that he's, he's right. You're not going to crash. You're not going to burn. You're going to make it. Right? Right? He knows the plans He has for you. If nothing else, say this plane can't crash because I'm on it and I still got stuff to do for God. If it was going to crash and the enemy had gotten anything over on it, His plan just got destroyed because I stepped on here. Amen? Thank you, Lord. We can trust Him. What's it say in Romans? It says, if God be for us, who can be against us? There is nothing that can stand against us. If love, unfailing God, is for you, no failing enemy can be against you. He is a failure. He has failed. There's no extra credit. There's no bonus class. He can't go back and retake it. He's done. Kicked out of school. Right? No tuition. Can't be brought back. He is a loser. He cannot come to you and make you one of His. But what He wants to do is keep you from God's best. And if He can get you to quit trusting in what God's given, then He can get you to not have God's best. Amen? Amen? Look at this. It says, look at 1 Chronicles 5.20. He's talking about a, one of the groups of the Israelite children and uh, in verse, and they were coming against the people called the Hagarites. 
I don't want to be around. I don't want to have no Hagarites around me. The old hags. <laughs> and these people were coming against them. In verse 20, it says, and they were helped against them. It says they were helped against them. And the Hagarites were delivered into their hand and all that were with them. For they cried to God in the battle, and he was entreated of them. Why? Because they put their trust in him. God is entreated. He, he entreats your request because you trust him. You know, so many people say, you've got to have faith, I've got to have faith. Yes, you've got to have faith, but trust is what undergirds your faith. It what, it's what says, I can stand forever because I know God will not fail me. Amen? And he was entreated of them because they trusted him. They put their trust in him, and because they did, he took care of it. Why? Because he said he would. And when he says he would, he'll do what he says he was, does whenever somebody chooses to trust him. Amen? And because they trusted him, they got what he said. Amen? Right? They committed their way unto the Lord. Right? You, have you committed your way unto the Lord? Right, where's that verse at? Do you guys remember? Because I don't. Commit your way unto the Lord. Thir uh, Psalm 37? Is that where it is? They have it. Come on. Come on, guys. Show me some love. Show me some love. There we go. Commit thy way, commit your way unto the Lord, and He'll bring it to pass. No? Huh? No. Trust also in Him. You can commit your way all you want, but if you lose trust, He can't bring it to pass. You tied His hands, you limited Him. Why? Because you didn't trust Him. You must trust. You, can, you know, you got people they, all day long and say, Oh, I am committed. I am in faith. I am standing for this. I will never quit. I, I am never going to quit. Never, ever, ever. I got the word. I'm going. And two weeks later, you'll see them and say, It has been two weeks. How long do I have to wait? I've been believing this word for nigh on two weeks now. Goodness sakes. He is God. Could he not move? You got people saying that kind of stuff. Well, he can do anything he wants. Why don't he help me? Because you say that. You just tied his hands because you don't trust him. You're trying to manipulate him because he has resource. That's not love. That's not you. If you had a kid that tried to manipulate you to get every toy they wanted, you wouldn't want to get them anything. <laughs> well, I <it> got quiet. <laughs> Our trust in the Lord is what he's looking for. He desires us to trust him. He desires for us to believe in what he says and hold on to it so tightly and refuse to let go of what he says, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what the enemy tries to lie to you about, no matter what he says, you are unwilling to let go of his word. You see a storm coming, and it's a tornado, and he said, he told me it wouldn't come near my dwelling. You better have a word if you're going to stand in front of a tornado, by the way. And you better be ready to trust. I ain't telling people to stand in front of a tornado. But you do have a word. You do have a word. And if you can trust, you can stand there and it can't come near your dwelling. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. But we have to be unwilling to let go. No matter if that wind blows your feet off the ground, it's not time to let go of His word. It's time to hold tighter. Because guess what? I don't care if your feet are off the ground. If you're holding on to His Word, you're still in the same place you were. Your feet just aren't on the ground anymore. <laughs> right? If there were a pole right here and I was holding on to it and the wind came and blew my feet off the ground, but I didn't let go of that pole, guess where I'd be when the wind stopped? Same place I was when the wind started. That's where we should be with God. That's where we should be with God's Word. Okay, we're going to look at Hezekiah. Let's look at that's That's somebody that was like that. Amen? Hezekiah. Look at 2 Kings. 
It's going to be a long trip, but we can take it. Long trip, but we can do it. Hezekiah. Everybody likes Hezekiah, right? God liked him, so we should like him. Amen? He was an example from the Old Testament of how people could grab hold of what God told them and promised them and refuse not to have the promise. But you know what he had to do? Trust God. Trust God. And guess what? The enemy tried to get him not to. Why? Because he knew he was. If, if the devil knows you're trusting God, the only thing he can do to defeat you is to get you to not trust God. Right? Right? Does that make sense? That's, what, that's the only thing he can do. So he's going to try every way. Look at 2 Kings 18, verse 5. I'm going to read it in the NIV this time because then you can understand it. But I am going to read a lot of it in the King James, and the reason I am is because they changed the word trusted in here many times to depended on, which is good because we should depend on God. But trusting God so many more times is, is more than just depending on Him. It's refusing to let go of what He says. It's, it's stronger word than just depend on Him to me. Okay? It says, Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, and there was no one like, there was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast. What did he do? It said, in the King James it says clave. I don't know what clave is, but it sounds like a really tight hold. Like if I were going to clave to you, you probably wouldn't like it, would you, Ty? I'd probably, I'd probably cut off circulation to your arm, claving. He held fast to the Lord, which means he held fast to what he says. You don't hold fast to somebody you don't believe. He held fast to the Lord because he knew the promises and the goodness of God were true. Amen? He held fast to the Lord and did not cease to follow him. He kept the commands of the Lord that he kept the commands the Lord had given Moses. And the Lord was with him. He was successful. What's it say in the King James? He prospered. And we we tried to say this word with or so ever. Sounds like Sylvester, with her so ever, Sylvester the cat. <laughs> Tweety went with her so ever, and I couldn't get him. <laughs> he prospered everywhere he went to. And he stood up. This, they can call it rebelled, but what he did was he stood up against the king of Assyria and would not serve him. Why? Because he trusted the Lord. You can't trust the Lord and, and, and give in to the pressures of the enemy. Amen? Amen. The enemy's going to pressure you. How many know if you got six bills due and you get the money for all six of them, he'll try to get one more through your door. Yeah. Why? Because he wants you to quit. He believes in the last straw. He wants the one that breaks the camel's back. Why? Because He does not want you to be a light to the world. When we receive the goodness of God in this lifetime, then we are a light to those who are not. Amen? And when we receive and hold fast to His promises, and we receive life and health, when we receive His divine nature, when we receive prosperity, when we have peace, when everything around us is a storm, then we show His goodness. And you can't have that unless you're trusting God. It's His Word. He's the one that says, I'll give you peace that passes understanding. Right? right? In other words, you'll have peace and they won't understand it. You won't even understand it. How do you expect them to? They'll say, why are you so happy? And they say, because God's good. And they'll say, how do you know? Because I know. They'll say, show me. And I'll say, see my smile? Amen? Amen. <laughs> he was successful in whatever he undertook, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria. This was a big deal. The king of Assyria had come along, and, you know, we'll try to shorten the story a little bit, but he starts taking over. He's a bad dude. And he'll tell you how bad he is. Why? Because he wants you to believe it. Guess what? The enemy will tell you how big and bad he is. Why do you think so many people on the earth today think the devil is so big and bad? Because he's been portrayed that way. Not because he is. Amen. 
He's about this big. He is truly Toto, or, or the man behind the screen in The Wizard of Oz. He really is. He's this, he's this little bitty guy that's got a microphone and a big, giant, fat head that's not real. He's the Wizard of Oz. People say, what are you doing talking about wizards in church? I'm talking about the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> it's not even real. <laughs> but that's what the devil's like. And if you pull the screen back, what you'll really see is what he really is. And all you needed to defeat him was a little bitty dog about that big. <laughs> I'm a simple man, okay? <laughs> and the king of Assyria thought he was big and bad, and he was talking bad about God. I mean, he comes in here, he takes over part of Israel, and he takes their people, and he moves them out of their country and moves them into another country. He says, I want this country, you go over there. And he goes to some of the fortified cities of Judah, and he starts taking them. Where, where, where Hezekiah is the king? Some of these other cities. And he starts taking them. And he, and he comes, and, and so Hezekiah says, Oh, have I offended you? Don't get, don't get Hezekiah wrong. He's not giving in. He's saying, Did I offend you in some way? He said, Well, what can I do to make this right with you? And, and the king says, You know what? You can give me a 300... 300 whatever shekels or whatever of gold and 30 shekels of what is it shekels or what do they call it shekels whatever a shekel is he wanted 300 of them in gold and 300 of them in silver or backwards huh 300 of them in silver and 30 of them in gold all right see I knew I was there I read the story a hundred times this morning I think you know why because reading through it you're confused as to who's talking because the enemy's doing all the talking. If you read the story, the enemy is doing all the talking. Why? Because he's trying to convince Hezekiah and his people to quit God. And, and Hezekiah says, so Hezekiah that goes and he gets some silver and some gold, but he doesn't get what he asked for. And he gives it to him. And uh, the king of Assyria is not impressed with that gift at all right because and, and he did go get some gold and he did go get some silver but he didn't get obviously he didn't get what the king wanted or the king would have been happy and the king was not happy amen you guys with me what verse are we on do you know 16 put up 16 we'll see where we're at yeah he went and he at that time he cut off the gold he, he'd already went and got silver and he cut off the gold from the doors. He went and got the gold off the doors. The gold he had put there. He'd had his people put it there. Cut it off and from the, and from the pillars that, that were overlaid. And he gave that to the king of Assyria. Verse 17. And the king of Assyria did not like that. He sent people. Guess what? The enemy's got people. And he's going to send them to you when he's not satisfied that you aren't quitting. And what he saw in Hezekiah was unquit. Is unquit a word? It is today. He saw unquit in Hezekiah. And so he sent people, Tartan and Rebs, or whew, yeah, he sent people with weird names too. He sent them to Hezekiah with a great host. He didn't just send people. He said, I'm going to send some people and some scary people. Right? So I'm going to send people and we're going we're to get him to quit. Because this trusting in the Lord thing, it could become an epidemic. The, the, he starts trusting in God, and we see the goodness of God, and other people see the goodness of God. They start trusting in God. Next thing you know, everybody's going to be trusting in God, and they won't tell anybody how great the king of Assyria is. We can't have this. So he sent people, and they went up that, and they, with a great host against Jerusalem, and they came up and came to Jerusalem, and when they were come up, they came up and stood at, by the conduit huh, of the upper pool. You know what? I guarantee you a man wrote the, the Old Testament. 
because every time they give directions, they're by a gas station or <laughs> next door to the old barn, and there's a stump where you turn with an axe head in it, and right? There's no street names. There's no, no. right? Just like last time we talked. <laughs> Conduit by the upper pool, which is at the highway. It's over right over there by Fuller's Field. You know where that is. Yeah. Yeah, Fuller's Field. We played ball there as kids. Sure. Verse 18. And when they'd called to the king, there came out to him El Eliakim. El Eliakim? The son of Hil Hilkiah. Phew. They were proud of that stuff, too. Call me Elkim. And I'm the son of Hilkiah which was over the household of Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder. Verse 19. <laughs> there he is, man. You know, he sent somebody with a name like this because this is like something you'd see in Transformers, man. Yeah. It's got to be a big bad name. Rob Shika. <laughs> That's who's going to talk to you. Nah, -huh. Rob Shika said unto them, Speak ye now to Hezekiah. In other words, talk to Hezekiah. He's messed up, and he's messing up worse. Just tell him the great king. Tell him me. You notice the enemy can only get himself to talk good about him? Because <laughs> anybody in his camp knows he ain't good. If they do talk good about him, it's because they have to. That's why God don't want people talking good about him, because they have to. Right? Don't, don't ever tell people how good God is because you have to, because He is. Right? Now, if they want to talk bad about the enemy, you can all day, because He is. He's, he's a yucky, ugly mess. But remember, Toto took care of him. All right? Every time you think of the devil, you'll think of Toto now. Right? <clears throat> Thus said the great king of Assyria, What confidence? Who are you? And who are you believing in that's greater than me? I be the king of Assyria. Phew. That's what he's saying. That's exactly what he's saying. Verse 20. Thou sayest, <laughs> thou sayest, you say, but they are, but you say, but they're vain words. I have counsel and strength for the war. What's he saying? He's saying, you don't have anything against me. I'm, I'm the king of Assyria. Now on whom do you trust? Because your words are vain. Who are you trusting? And who, who are you trusting that you would rebel against the king of Assyria? He, he should just say that after every sentence he says, because that's really what he's saying. I'm the king of Assyria. You're rebelling against the king of Assyria. And I don't know what you think about the king of Assyria, but the king of Assyria, he's a great man. You know, the, the, the devil's an eye man. He's an eye man. He's trying to get you to believe that I is good. He wants, you to believe your, he wants you to believe in the I, because I don't trust in He. Amen? <laughs> now, who, who are you going to trust? Who are you that's going to rebel against me? Verse 21. Now, behold, you trust in a, in, in, upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt? What's he doing? He's trying to get him to trust in something else. Everybody says, oh, he's just going on. No, he's trying to give him other options. Saying you trusting in God, or you could be trusting in the Pharaoh of Egypt. Why else would he mention this? They, they didn't talk. They, no one said anything about the Pharaoh, and all of a sudden he brings up the Pharaoh. He says he's a king. All that trust on him. <laughs> Verse twenty-two. He gets off that way because no one's moving. Do you notice he said how great he is, and and none of the people that went out to meet this great king, or the, actually his people have been moved even an inch. Why? Because they're trusting in the Lord. Yeah, right. When you're trusting in the Lord, it doesn't matter how hard the wind blows. Yeah. It doesn't matter how big the problem is. Why? I'm trusting in the Lord. And when it gets at its worst, that's not when it's time to quit the Lord because He's the biggest. Right, yeah. Amen? Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the commercial bigger is better. Yeah. Biggest is the best. And we serve the biggest. And, and he can be bigger still. There, he, there's, no, there's no depth to his bigness. <laughs> he, can get, he can get as big as he needs to be. Amen? He says, but if you say you trust in the Lord our God, 
Is it not he whose high places and whose altar Hezekiah is taking? Oh, I can't, get to the, I can't get to the head, so I'll try to get the people. Why? Division. It's the devil's way. What? Let me get you to, what? I can't, I can't get you to believe that? Let me see if I can get your wife to believe it. Because if I could cause division in your household, I could tear up your marriage. Huh? Yeah. Let me see if I can get some of the people who work for you to believe something bad. Because if I can get them to believe something bad. How many churches do we got because somebody believed something different? This is a, this is a denomination breaker. Yeah. Or builder, I should say. Amen. <laughs> denomination, separate nations. Think that's God's idea? I don't think so. He's for unity, not division. Amen? Amen? But that's what he's doing. He's saying, you know, I, I can't get to Hezekiah. You're the one standing out here. Let me see if I can get you to talk bad about him. Let me see if I can get you to quit. Because if I can get you to quit, divide the nation, then I can get Hezekiah to quit because he'll get, he'll get all upset. And then I can just do this. I can spoil this whole thing. The enemy's not going to quit trying. You know what? We're waiting for a day when he quits. I know when that day is. It's when the key is taken out of the door from hell and he's in there forever. That's the day he quits. Amen? And if you're waiting for, for you not to have human thoughts and, and, and an extra idea, there's going to be a devil. Right? People who don't believe there's a devil, <laughs> it doesn't make there less of a devil. Kind of like people who don't believe there's a God. There's still a God, and He's a good one. Amen? So let me, let me see if I can mess with the people now. Hezekiah, he's the one that took the high places away. That's where you were supposed to worship. He doesn't even know the Word. They're not supposed to, they were supposed to take down the high places all along. He got mad at the kings that didn't take down the high places. Right? He said, he, said, he took away your high places, and he says, you'll worship in Jerusalem. That's because God said so. Why? Because Hezekiah trusted the Lord and there was never another one like him. Amen? So, this didn't move him. Verse 23. Now, therefore, I pray, give me pledges. That's the next end. This is garden talk, guys. This is garden talk. This is how the devil talked to Eve in the garden. This is, this is deception. What can I do to get you on my side to not see God for who He really is? Let, let me, I, need to, I need to distort your vision of God. They, he's trying to distort their vision of Hezekiah. Why? Because that is their access to God. And if I can distort your vision, then I can get you to do something stupid, like quit. Amen? Garden talk. If you ever hear yourself hearing garden talk... Shut your ears. Go like this. I ain't listening. I, uh, da, la, 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 la. Like your little kid did when she didn't want to hear you say clean your room. Yeah. <laughs> Give pledges to my Lord. Switch camps. Give pledges to my Lord and I'll deliver you. Oh, now he's going to give them gifts. <laughs> wow. What a great guy. You know, this guy that took over all these countries, we come to find out he's really good. The guy that killed all these people, he's really not such a bad guy. We, all we got to do is give him pledges and, and turn our allegiance over to him and call him Lord, and he'll give us 2,000 horses that we can ride all the time. I'll give you a good big pony if you'll do what I ask. <laughs> going to get a mockingbird, a diamond ring, and... If that diamond ring turns brass. Yeah. <clears throat> give, me, give me some stuff and I'll make you great. Verse 24. How, <laughs> how then wilt thou turn away the face of the one captain of the least of my master's servants? In other words, how are you going to turn away the least of us? And put your trust in Egypt. Now he's got back to talking about Egypt. Well, that's probably where he messed up. He should have stuck on what he was at. He goes right back to Egypt. He said, you put your trust in Egypt and chariots and for horsemen. Verse 25. Am I come up now without the Lord? What's he going to do? Now he's talking like the Lord sent him. This is the enemy, guys. This is the enemy. He's saying, 
Could, would I come up here? He's talking about his Lord. Yeah, I had to read this several times too because I look at him like, what is he talking about? It's actually him talking. He's telling them that the Lord told him to destroy this place. That's what it looks like to me. If you find out different, tell me. <laughs> the Lord said, go up against this land and destroy it. 26? <laughs> then, then, they, then they quit. Then they started talking. Then said Eliakim, the son of Hilk Hilkiah and Shebna. He's the son of all these people. Unto Rabshakeh. He said, speak, he said speak, in, uh, speak in Aramaic. Speak in uh, Jewish, or don't speak in the Jewish language. Because there were people there and he didn't, want, he didn't want them having to hear all this. He said, speak, speak in a language that we can understand and they can't. Guess what? The enemy ain't giving in to nothing you ask. Why, why would you ask the enemy for something? Because they ain't going to do it. And he didn't do it. Next verse. 27. He said, hath my master made me like you, basically? He said, I don't have to do what you say. That's just a nasty verse. I'm not even going to read it. <laughs> verse 28. <laughs> and Reb Shekah called, cried out in a loud voice in the Jewish language. Why? He's, he is the picture of rebellion. The enemy is the picture of rebellion. Anything you do, he will say different. That's how we know it's him. If it's contrary to God's word, it's the enemy. Right. Amen? Amen? And so he wouldn't speak that way. Why? Because he wanted to scare the rest of the people. Right? He's like, if you won't believe how great I am, maybe they will. Maybe I can get them to turn on you, and then you'll turn on him. i got to get a big war going here. Verse 29, Thus saith the king, he's still talking for his king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you. Oh, now he's got to make Hezekiah look bad again. Hezekiah is deceiving you. That preacher that told you that if you had faith to believe, you could prosper? I can't believe you're believing him. You need to find another preacher. You need to find one that will tell you sometimes God wants you sick. <laughs> These preachers that are talking about health and prosperity, that's just of the devil. <laughs> Use the word deceive, that had to be of the devil, right? What? This preacher told you you could be happy and have peace in the midst of a storm? Well, are you just going to believe anything? What's he trying to do? He's trying to get them not to trust God. Right. If I can get you to trust anything but God, believe something bad if you have to, just don't believe God. Why? Because if you are trusting God, that's what you're trusting. If you're not trusting God, you are trusting something else. Amen. You know, people like to believe they're not trusting anything. Wrong again. What's it, go, look at, or don't, even, don't go there, but Jeremiah 17, verse 5, what's it talk about? Cursed is the man that trusts in the arm of the flesh. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord, whose hope is in Him. Amen? That's what God's saying. You, you need to be trusting in the Lord, because that's where the blessing is. If you're not trusting in the Lord, you're trusting where the curse is. There's only two choices. We will do one. Amen? He said, he said, Hezekiah is deceiving you. For you shall not be, he shall not be able to deliver you out of, or he, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand, out of the king's of Assyria's hand. That's what he's saying. He's saying, he's deceiving you. Neither let Hezekiah make you, make you trust. What's he saying? Don't let him sway you, persuade you. Don't let him build your faith and encourage you. Don't let him edify you and make you think crazy thoughts like you're more than a conqueror and you can be healed. Don't let him make you think you can prosper and have every good thing that God ever promised you. That's just crazy. He's, he's just lying. That's the, that, what's, has anybody ever heard this junk? If you haven't, you will. The enemy has no new tricks. He's been doing it since the garden, and he's still doing it today. What's he, try, what's he saying? He's saying, cast away your confidence. He's saying, cast away your confidence. It's in the wrong thing. The Word of God says, cast not away your confidence. 
Why? He wants you to cast it off because he doesn't want the reward of confidence. There is a reward for being confident. Confidence is a trust word. It says, I won't quit. It says, I'll be here. I'll stand. I will never, ever quit what God has told me will come to pass. Amen? He says, don't let him make you trust the Lord, saying, trust the Lord what? Saying, if the Lord said it, what? It shall come to pass. If the Lord said it, it shall come to pass, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the kingdom of Assyria. What's he saying? He's, Hezekiah is saying what God said. Yeah. Hezekiah is not moving. Hezekiah is immovable. It doesn't matter what the enemy says. It doesn't matter what the enemy does. It doesn't matter how big the enemy says he is. It doesn't matter how bad they, they say God is. And, you know, he goes on after this. He says, he talks about how, well, don't these people have a God? And we defeated them. And these people have a God and we defeated them. And, and it, Hezekiah later on says, their gods were all wood and stone. <laughs> after they were done, they burned them. That's what Hezekiah thought of those gods. Well, how hard is it to defeat a, a god of wood and stone? You go over and you go, and it falls over. <laughs> right? But you're not going to defeat this god. And Hezekiah knew this was the living god. This was the almighty god. And he was trusting this god. And he was not going to be moved. What verse were we on? And he wasn't casting away his confidence. Verse 31. Hearken not unto Hezekiah, for thus saith the king, Make an agreement, give me a present, come to me, and then, then I'll give you your own. What's he saying? You're not serving a good king, you're serving a bad king. If you'll come to me, I'll give you your own. This is garden talk again. It's like he goes from one thing to another. Don't trust in God, trust in me. Why? That's what he wants. He doesn't want you trusting in God. He does want you trusting in Him. He says, I'll give you, I'll give every one of you, your own vineyard, fig trees, your own wells. Man, you'll be happy, happy, happy. Verse 32, until I come and take it away. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that neat? Yeah. I'll come and take it away to a land like yours. I'll take it away to a land just like yours. Oh, yeah, it'll be great. No, oh, sure, no, it won't be the land God promised you. No, but it'll be great. I'll take it away. It's just like the enemy, though. I'm going to give you all this and then take it away. <laughs> you look so good. Not so much. <laughs> he, he's a deceiver. He is evil. I, I never talk around your back or when you can hear me. <laughs> You're such a great person as far as you know. <laughs> he's an enemy. He doesn't like you, love you, or care about you. He will leave you to die as soon as He can get you in His hand. As soon as He can get you. And He says all this, and He said, Don't let Hezekiah persuade you, saying. In other words, quit listening to what the Lord said. And that's what He would say to you. How can I get Him to quit? Quit listening to those people who say, By whose stripes you were healed. Half of them are sick. He'll lie to you. They're not sick. They're healed. They're, they just said. Amen. He's a liar. He's trying to get us to quit. Amen? He said, don't be persuaded when you hear him say what God said. Well, if God said it, it's true. The end. Amen. And if we will hold on to it with all our might, we will have. It will come to pass. If we choose to trust God, we will have what God said we have. We will be what God said we are, and we will live the life that God planned for us to live. If we cast not away our confidence. Amen? Cast not away. Why? It has great recompense of reward. Then what's he say? What's he say right after? He said, you have need of patience. Right? And we're in Hebrews now. I'm, I'm like in Hebrews and 2 Kings all at the same time. Right? Isn't that what he said? Looked to me like Hezekiah and his bunch were being pretty patient, weren't they? You know, I like what they later... What, what, what is it? Verse 36, what it says, what they did after all this talk? Yeah. 
It says the people held their peace and answered him not a word. That's what you do when the devil starts talking. Don't, you know what? We yell at the devil way too much. It requires nothing except ignoring him. Right? If you ignore the storm, you sleep better. Right? If you get up and look out the window and wonder if it's coming to your house, you ain't sleeping. That's right. Right? Right? A good rain will help you sleep. Right? Right? Why? Because you can't get up and do anything anyway. Might as well sleep. (laughs) They held their peace and they said not a word, for that's what Hezekiah told them to do. They didn't unhook one inch one inch from their leader, from their man of God. Amen? That is so important. We don't unhook from what we don't... The enemy is trying for division. He's trying for offense. He's trying for envy. He's trying for strife. He's trying to get something in there that will cause us, me, you, anyone else to unhook from their man of God. Right? Right? Now he tries to get you to unhook from Jesus. Right? He wants you to unhook. Uh, Yeah, well, I know it said redemption, but part of that plan is later on in heaven. Redemption. What part of that? That means if I go and redeem it, it's now mine. Right? Do I only get half of it? Right? No. When it's redeemed, you get all of the redeemed. He redeemed us wholly. And and he tries to lie with parts and pieces of the word and get you to believe. You know, he he gets verses like, in this world there will be tribulation. (laughs) Amen, brother. (laughs) What about, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. (laughs) Right? We serve a good God. Don't listen to the devil's lies and don't answer him back. Speak only the word. Amen? Trust only in God. Cast not away your confidence. Amen? As as we keep our trust in the Lord, then we gain everything that He is in our lives. We, We refuse to let go. We grab hold. And no matter what's going on, we don't care what we see. We don't care what happens. We don't care what people say. We don't care. The Lord is our stronghold. He's our shield and our buckler. He helps me. He saves me from my enemies. You're not looking for another way. If you're looking for another way, the devil will show it to you. He will give you credit cards to make your bills higher. Yeah, sure. Haven't you guys ever had that? Man, I got all these bills due, and in the mail that day comes that free check. Oh, yeah. Just write this out, pay your bills, and you'll be happy until next month when I send you a bill plus 22% for the rest of your life. There's always going to be a plan B. We sticking with plan A. Amen? We're sticking with plan A. Amen? God's not a man that he should lie. If he said it, it's true. Amen? He cannot lie to us. And if we'll cast not away. Let's just go to that. That's what we're going to talk about. Cast not away. We'll close with this. Hebrews 10, verse 35. And think about why he's talking about this. He says at the beginning of this whole thing, he says, Call to remembrance. Call to remembrance. Where is that about? Where did we find that earlier today? First 32, 31, something like that? Call to remembrance. But call to remembrance the former days. In other words, how many of you guys have ever had a victory in your life? This is what God says think about. He says call to remembrance when you won. Call to remembrance when they were going to kick you out of your house, but you got your rent. Call to remembrance when you were healed. Call to remembrance when you didn't miss a day of school and they said you would. Call to remembrance what God did for you. When you had a great fight, of a, when you were illuminated, what were you? You got light. You got His Word. You, got, you heard the Word of God and you were illuminated. I like being illuminated. Amen? Because you're now a light bulb. Amen? Right. And, you, and you endure. Why? Because you had a word. Yes. And if you've got a word, you'll endure a great flight of affliction. And when, call, recall those days. Whenever everything seems to be going wrong, don't let the enemy talk. 
Talk about what his talk about your victories. Talk about the things you've done. Do what David did. I, I beat the lion. I beat the bear. Goliath, you ain't going to be nothing. Right? Guess what? Everybody in here has had something you thought you weren't going to make it through, and you're here today. You're here today. Guess what? Recall that. Yeah, but it wasn't fun, brother. It doesn't matter if it were fun. You made it. Amen? Recall that. And then go back to verse 35. So cast not away your confidence. Don't cast away your confidence. It has reward. What was Hezekiah's reward? God came down and he smoked the Assyrians. He took care of them. They didn't even fight. He smote them. Why? Because they were talking about him like he was no big God. You want to see no big God? People don't talk about God. Don't hurt God's kids. People don't do that. It's not a good thing. There's great recompense and reward for hanging on, for cleaving to the Word of God and refusing to leave it. Amen? Cast not away your trust. Your trust in who He is, in who He is to you, in His love for you. That's confidence. If you'll understand, that's why Paul wrote it that way. He said that you'd know the love of God. Why? Because if you know the love of God, you have confidence in what He'll do for you. Amen? That's right. Amen? Because He loves you. He won't quit on you. He's not going to let you go down. He's not going to let anything happen to you. He loves you. Amen? He loves you. Cast not away your confidence, therefore. It has great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience. What's He saying? I need you to start operating in some love. People say, what's that got to do with patience? Patience is a love word. Right? Love is patient. Love is kind. What's he trying? Think about, the, think about the rich young ruler. Rich young ruler. Everybody knows the story of rich young ruler, right? Runs up to Jesus and said, what do I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, you know the commandments? He said, oh, yeah, commandments. Honor your father and mother, blah, blah, blah. Done all those. And Je what's the first thing Jesus said? He said, you have need of one thing. You lack one thing. And he said, go sell and give. Go sell and give. Yeah. What was he doing? He needed some love. Yeah. He, you, can, you can be obedient to God all your life and never love someone. He needed, to, he needed him to operate on a level of love as God did. But he was asking him to be a giver. People say, oh, he was just asking him because that money was all in the way. No, he wanted him to be a giver. If he gave all that money away and had not love, what would, his, what would its value have been? We've got verse on that, don't we? Right? He wanted him to be a giver. God is trying to make you like him. Every day, he's trying to make you as he is. Amen? And every time he gives you a promise, if he says you have need of patience and patience is born out of love, he's saying you need to use your love. Why? Because patience is cheerful, hopeful endurance. It's not just endurance. It's cheerful, hopeful endurance. We see a thousand people going, oh, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it, I'll make it. Leave me alone, I'll make it. I'm going to make it. I told you I would make it. I'll make it. I hate this. It's awful. hope I never have to do it again, but I'm going to make it. That is not cheerful, hopeful endurance. That is endurance of a sort, but it's hateful, mad endurance. Right? He said you need a patience. In other words, hopeful, cheerful endurance, an expectation of good. An expectation that what God said He was going to do, He's going to do for you. And when you begin to operate in that patience, knowing that you've done the will of God, it says you have need of patience. That after you've done the will of God, you already did the will of God. you got too many people quitting when it comes to the patience. stuff. I did the will of God. They, and they'll come to you and they'll say, I've done everything I know to do. I did this. The Word said do this. I did this. The Word said do this. I did this. The Word said this. The Word said that. And I did it. I did it. I did it. Why isn't it all happening? Because you have need of patience. Hopeful. Cheerful, 
Patience, endurance. What is that? It's coming. It's coming. The God said, I have it. I have it. I don't care if I see it. I have it. I will see it. I have it. Cheerful, hopeful endurance. You know that God cannot fail. He is an unfailing God. It's cheerful and it's hopeful, and you don't sit around thinking about it. Amen. You know, you got people, I've been believing, I've got to wait on God now. It says I've got to have patience, I'm just going to sit and wait. If you'll ever come pay my bills, then I'll go help at the church. If you'll ever come pay my bills, maybe I'll teach in that class, or I'll go help some other people, go work at the soup kitchen. I just got to wait for him to pay my bills. Maybe you should go work at the soup kitchen while he's paying your bills. Hmm? Maybe waiting isn't sitting. Maybe waiting is serving. Hmm? Maybe waiting is getting up and getting out. Quit thinking about you for a second. Oh, but you don't know I'm in such big problems. If you, won't, if you quit thinking about them, you won't even notice. Right? What do you try to do to a little kid that just mashed his finger? You try to get him to quit thinking about it. Oh, look at here, lollipop. Ooh. <laughs> man, they quit thinking about it for a second, man. They're laughing. Yeah. There's a little girl out here, I forget, at, at uh, I think at the fall, fall social, and she fell down and scraped her knee. And man, she was crying to beat the band. <laughs> and man, I had some candy in my hand. I said, look, I got some candy. She starts smiling. <laughs> and then I go, oh, you need to, oh, uh, yeah, uh, uh. man, serve God. Quit looking at your knee. Quit looking at your need, serve God. Which too many are like, oh, yeah, oh man. Pol bipolar, I guess. We got the bad polar, the good polar, and we're looking at both. Get off the pole. <laughs> Glory to God. Serve the Lord. I don't care what you're going through. Serve the Lord. It's your way out because you're trusting Him that what He said He would do for you, He will do. And because He said it, I'm going to go serve my God with all my heart, with all my soul. With all, not to get that, because I have that. People that are patient already have it. You're cheerful and hopeful because you're having it. Right? If you truly believed it, you'd never think about it again. I never wonder whether I have a car to go home in. It's out here. I'm not sitting there saying, I wonder if I, I got to serve God, but man, how am I going to get home? I know how I'm going to get home. I got a car. You know you're healed. You got a word. You know you got peace. Jesus left you his. We've got the most high God on our side. And we should never cast away our confidence in what he said, our confidence in what he's done. Cast not away your confidence, for you have need of patience, and after you've done the will of God, that you might receive the promise. Why might you? Because if you don't get patient and begin to do the will of God, you'll quit. You'll quit. That's why he said might. People say, well, I thought the promise was sure. It's surely a promise. Whether you get it or not is up to you. His promises are yes and amen. Right? Does that mean everybody's got them? No. Yes and no. It means they have them, but they got to receive them. Amen? Amen? That's a sideways shake. Glory to God. It's our job to receive these. God has so much for us that He's given by grace. And he says, cast not away your confidence. He says, for in a little while it will come. He will come. It shall not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draws back, that's not us. We're not the ones that are pulling back and quitting. Is that anybody in here? Do I got any drawbackers in here? No, no drawbackers. That's a good word, drawbackers. Yeah, we're not, we're not of those that draw back. It said, if any man draws back, I have no pleasure in him. Why? It's not because he's mad. See, never look at God like he's mad at you. God is not mad. Amen. He's not going to get mad. You're not going to make him mad. Jesus was his peace offering. He said, I'm not mad. Peace on earth. Goodwill towards men. Yes. I'm not mad. Look at that Christmas verse right here. <laughs> Glory to God. I got it all in today. Thank you, Lord. 
He said, I'll have no pleasure in him. Why? Well, because he takes pleasure in the prosperity of his people. And when we draw back, he cannot give us what he has for us. He says, don't draw back. I don't take pleasure in that. He said, but we are not. <laughs> Say that with me. But I am not, I am not. of those who draw back. Those who draw back. I, am those I am those who push forward. Push forward. I, am those I am those that he takes pleasure in. Takes pleasure. Stand with me. Say this after me. I'll never, I'll never. Draw, back. draw back. I'll never quit. I'll, never quit. I'll have. The promise of God, I am patient. I will wait. I will serve. I will have the goodness of God in my life. I am not of those who draw back. I am not of those who draw back. But I am of those who draw forward. I am of those who live by faith. I trust, God. I trust God. He's never failed me, never failed. and He never will. He never will. Got a song? Jesus, Jesus, how.